Sheila. Hey, Shira. I'm really glad we made time to connect. Um, I think we talk about a lot of these topics uh, offline, and we haven't really had a chance to dive into mass adoption, what it means, why it matters, um, how we get there, and the kind of uh, lack of creative clarity about those questions. Um, but before we dive into the, to the meat of it, I think it would be great for you to share who you are, um, not just your title, but just um, a few words uh, about who you are. And then I'd ask you to actually share why you're here in the blockchain space um, from a kind of core vision. Like what about your vision for the world aligns with your hopes for what this technology could do? Yeah, well, thanks for asking it that way. So I'm Sheila Warren. Uh, I am, by title, I am the head of blockchain digital assets and data at the World Economic Forum, and I work out of our San Francisco office. Uh, I am a civic tech junkie. I'm a lawyer by training. I've thought a lot about uh, equity and social justice in various different contexts, um, but I also spent some time uh, at a Wall Street law firm and working with big banks and hedge funds and others. So um which all kind of relate to why I am so deeply excited, remain so deeply excited about blockchain technology. Uh, and for me, what's so exciting is that over the course of my career, I have had the privilege of sitting within uh, and adjacent to many different institutions, very powerful institutions in many cases. And I have seen firsthand how major institutions don't actually serve society uh, as much as, you know, they serve a small segment of society. Um, and in many cases, they don't serve, they actively are a disservice to many members of society. And to me, what I think blockchain represents uh, as, a, as a philosophy, if we will, is an opportunity for us to think hard and do a lot of self-examination of some of our systems, particularly those that we know are not serving big swaths of the population and to really think about how we can do better. Uh, and I think the very nature of this technology lends itself to that kind of assessment and examination as long as we're open to it. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Sheila. And if uh, it wasn't communicated earlier, I'm Shira Frank. I'm the CEO of Made in Global. We work on global user research and I'm based in Boulder, Colorado. And these are paintings from all of my grandmothers. Um, so Sheila, you started to talk about the, a bit of the why and a bit of the difference and the distinction. Um, and you know, you mentioned institutions and their relationship to people and to society, and maybe the possibility to change that. I'm curious if, if, if there are other ways in which you think this technology might be historic, um, or if you think that is kind of the pinnacle of the opportunity that we should be focused around, or if there are any other pieces that make this technology perhaps different. Um, and I'll and I'll share one thing that I that I notice, um, yeah. which isn't about the technology itself, but it's actually about um, the fact that it is emerging, that it's a systemic technology, and that it's a financially um, yeah. it's a financial technology. So the the particular systems that this technology is playing on are unique, and the timing of that is unique, and the in the fact that we haven't had infrastructural financial um, change, say, at a moment when women and people of color had a modicum of access to education or a modicum of access to power. And so some of what I think the historic opportunity personally for me is that keeps me coming um, isn't just all the amazing, and there are amazing new things that are possible with the, tech, with the technology itself, but that's not what I think is the most extraordinary when we're looking at historic arcs of civilizational change. I think what's extraordinary is the fact that we have an opportunity to put DNA level, architecture level changes into um, a, a new kind of layer and a new um, infrastructure exactly. and architecture of society. So yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on that, but also if exactly. there's anything well, else. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, And I think that in many cases, what, did, what has technology done? It's digitized things that were already happening. It's codified existing systems of power, right? Uh, which don't get me wrong. There are a lot of benefits to that. I don't in any way. I'm not. I'm not sneezing at that or sneering at that. Um, however, this technology it is different. It just really is different. In and as you know, like we are at a time when there is more access. When there are again, we're still leaving out. Don't get me wrong. Huge swaths of people, 
but we certainly have a more inclusive ecosystem than we've had in the past. And when you look at previous industrial revolutions, who were they led by? They were led by, you know, those who were colonizers, conquerors, et cetera. And we are in a different time in many ways where there is an opportunity for some of the, the, the voices in our society that have traditionally been marginalized in every other major transformation that we've seen over the course of human history to actually be embedded in the way that we layer this technology into our policy stack. So and this is where, you know, I focus, and I know you have a tremendous amount of interest in this area as well in the work that you do, which is thinking about the policy levers that are that need to accompany or accommodate this technology, right? Because again, we're not changing human behavior here. What we can do is help channel and structure and set up systems that are going to mitigate risks in ways we couldn't really do before and amplify benefits. And in my mind, you know, that again, that's, that is the, the major opportunity that we really have to be careful not to miss. <laughs> Phenomenal. Phenomenal. No, I think that's, I mean, we could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to read a quote here and um, it's from Amber Balde, a leader in this space. And I just can never shake it. And um, I think it relates to this choice and this timing piece um, because she says, you know, the, the internet pioneers didn't foresee the corporate aggregation of power over the internet. So what are we doing today in blockchain to prevent our overlords of tomorrow. And again, that's Amber Balde. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say that, but I'll also ask you, you know, yeah, what key choices are we facing in this space? Say, yeah. at this time, I mean, we're not at year one of the evolution of this technology, but we're also not at year 30, right? It's not mass adopted. We're talking here about mass adoption and we'll get, we'll get to the details of that. But what are the choices facing us right now, say, that will ensure um, like that the ecosystem moves forward to take advantage of these opportunities that we're talking about. Um, what should we be paying attention to? What choices do we need to be thinking about? Yeah. Well, some of this, you know, is, is our, our concepts that we attempted to lay down in the Presidio principles. And so just a quick refresh on those are that our Global Blockchain Council, of which Amber is actually a member, um, and she and Clover have signed on to those principles. Uh, we're very grateful for that and for the support of many who helped pull that together. Uh, they're really kind of aiming to set a North Star for how do we think about not just user rights or user-centric design, but really about systems that are, that are um, incorporating the things that we've been talking about here today. And how do we do that? Well, I think it's beyond just diversity, equity, and inclusion and hiring practices, which gets a lot of airtime in technology and in technology systems. I think that is important. But I think even beyond that, we have to really be in this very agile state. You know, we really need to be constantly reevaluating who are we including, who are we excluding, who's in the room, who's being left out, you know, it, who, for whom is this, this, what we're designing, irrelevant, useless, harmful, like all these questions. And we need to be doing this, again, this tremendous amount of self-reflection on an ongoing basis. It's not something you can kind of box check and say, okay, we're kind of QAing our design process or we're QAing our community. You know, community curation and build is, is, it's just so hard. It's exhausting work and it never ends. It just never ends. So in my mind, you know, to answer your question a little bit more concretely, I think that we have to be examining the communities that we are engaging with when we think about product market fit. A lot of times we build for the easiest. We're trying to go fast. I understand that. We have responsibilities to investors and to others because we have to deliver. We have to land something quickly, right? And a lot of times that leads us down the path of the lowest hanging fruit. Well, who are the lowest hanging fruit? Those who already have access, those who are savvy, you know, these kinds of things. But we have to kind of lay, if, at a minimum, lay a breadcrumb trail to where we're going to go when it comes time to think about how we're going to make our product more accessible and who, which communities we've kind of just kicked out of our tents, you know, at the beginning that we never really bothered to bring back in. Yeah, that's, that's phenomenal. One way I talk about it, which I think is similar, but I'm curious your thoughts are that um, just in the simplest terms that, you know, we do have novel business models that are emerging right now. And we do have some novel data models that are emerging. And I think the internet had those as well. Mm -hmm. What they didn't, change or what they did not make novel were the human models that those business and data models circled around or stacked on top of or built on. And 
I would say essentially the human model that was built on was one of extraction. Humans are things that we can extract value from. Um, And so one of the questions that I think, you know, speaking of the choices maybe we're facing or the questions in the year ahead, say at this pivotal point for kind of the evolution of the ecosystem for me would be, well, if we're not putting a human model of extraction into our novel new data and business models and these new financial, you know, systems we're building, uh, what is our human model? And how do we discover something that isn't extraction? And is it an agency-based model? Is it something else? You know, I think those yeah. are key questions. And it's kind of like at the stack level, you know, not, yeah, not exactly. build things and then, and then later work, like you're saying, with people. It's, it's literally in the architecture phase. That That's exactly right. And creating new models. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we call this it, the forum at the forum. We kind of have this notion of stakeholder capitalism versus this extractive shareholder model. What if we actually thought about every part of the stakeholder ecosystem and define that actually quite broadly, not just from your producers and consumers, but actually thinking broadly about uh, internalizing some of your externalities, right? Like actually kind of making them visible and compensating in some ways, thinking about the global public commons, thinking about environment, all these different kinds of questions that could come into play. Um, I think it's something that's really important to us. And the way I think about it very concretely is what are we doing to equitably apportion risk and reward? Because right now we have a very clear reward model. We know where all of that flows. We know when a stimulus comes in, who is the first person that's paid out. Right? We, we, we know this. We can observe this. It's a very clear phenomenon. Even our reporting, some of our reporting forms accommodate that model. Uh, and similarly, we know that a lot of the risks, there's a lot of discussion happening in this space right now, both on the blockchain side and data side, about the fact that the test bed for a lot of innovation are vulnerable populations. Those who, who can't provide meaningful consent, who are being experimented upon. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's, a, it's a big problem, right? It's a big problem in, in many spaces, including the blockchain space, even though we don't talk about it as much, we kind of put it under the rug. How do we ensure that the risks are, again, being equitably apportioned, that there is some collective ownership of those risks and we're not just shoving you know, certain people into the category of those experimented upon uh, and others into the category of you know, reward gainers. So it's, um, all of these things can be done better than we've done in the past. We have an opportunity, again, with this technology and what it enables from just a peer-to-peer perspective to actually do better. So if we were to really like step back and be really honest and candid, what's blocking us from doing better? Mm. You know, what, what are the things standing in the way, whether they are ideas or um, structures or particular people or cultural norms? I mean, whatever feels like when you're, as you're advancing, um, and we'll talk more about all the things you're advancing, but you mentioned the Presidio principles, you mentioned apportioning risk, you know, you have these, this clarity. Of, of where attention needs to go, but what's standing in the way that we need yeah. to be thoughtful about? Yeah, a lot of, well, you know, uh, uh, some of it's fear. I think there is fear of making big transformative change. People default to incremental change because it feels comfortable. They, they feel like within their own risk calculation, they're making a tremendous change. And, and we respect that. You need to be feel where they are to some extent. Uh, some of this is just incumbent resistance. Some of it's inertia. And some of it, I think, is a failure on the part of blockchain ecosystem to actually make the case. We, have to, we bear some responsibility. It's not just that we're here with this thing that everyone's ready to, to buy. We have this great product that's going to sell. You know, it's just, we, have to, we have to be respectful of the fact that this technology has gone up and down. It's gone through cycles of hype. There's been a lot of nonsense and garbage you know, that wasted a lot of resources. And there is a skepticism about that that is a lot better and certainly, I think we have many those of us who remain in this space are very grateful to have seen the exit of some of these kind of sham, you know, projects or even fraudulent projects in some cases. Um, but that has an impact, you know. And so we do need to do a good job of marketing the opportunity in ways that I don't think that we are doing effectively. And that's not going to come from people taking a very politically anarchist approach to this, because that's not heard by those who are currently sitting in positions of power for reasons that I hope are pretty obvious. Um, And so I think there's a nuance to the messaging. And part of what I and the team have tried to do since I came to the forum is is create almost a journey for a lot of people in positions of power and and people who are not technologists themselves and don't make any claim to be and don't want to or need to be. And we shouldn't need them to understand the inner workings of the technology to understand its benefit. So we've tried very hard to be a very practical voice so that we can become a trusted and objective voice 
on this technology and what it can do and slowly create this journey to understanding that there is room for a lot of different, uh, a lot of different offerings here. It's not that we need to kind of tear everything down tomorrow in this really dramatic way. It's that there are different modes of engagement where we can accommodate a future reality. Where we can get there at a pace that is not going to feel catastrophic. And I think that, what is that pace? I mean, look, I mean, that's, you know, there's all kinds of people who studied the course of human history more than I have uh, who could give us a better sense. But I do think it's important to accommodate and acknowledge some of these realities. Yeah. Well, I mean, you see 80% of central banks exploring digital currency. Exactly. You know, so there, there's definitely a res- um there's appetite for it. There's, there's understanding. And, and yeah. like you say, so those are the blocks that at least as I heard them to um, say some of the values and, and potential of blockchain technology to transform the current financial system and, mm-hmm. and current technological patterns. I'm also curious though, what are the blocks internally to the blockchain ecosystem mm-hmm. actually scaling with integrity and advancing um, these new human models, discovering these new human models, embedding these new human models. Mm-hmm. I think we, we might talk about some values, actually, and we talk quite loudly about a lot of values related to economic freedom or, you know, you name the, the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I actually am curious if you agree, I encounter that the biggest blocks are not external to the transformational change this technology could make. I think the biggest barriers are internal. And that if we don't actually, as an ecosystem, have the ability to discover new human models, then we're not offering anything new. Like we're just building another financial ecosystem, fine. Mm-hmm. But how is it really meaningfully different than the current one? Um, yeah. I, so I think, sure. yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that, like I said, I mean, I think that a, a not great outcome, you know, to say the least, would be for us to just digitize what's already happening, to basically take, uh, to make things faster and more efficient. I mean, again, there's, I, there's something to be said for, for that, as, but it's not an endpoint, as far as I'm concerned, not with this technology. And so I think it's really important for us to think about how are we co-evolving this technology? I guess this is kind of the way I would frame it. You know, how are we providing more agency? How are we empowering uh, people? And that includes people within our own ecosystem. How are we empowering devs? How are we empowering those who are building? Like, how are we creating those feedback loops within our own build process so that we can hear the viewpoints, right? And so this is less than kind of, like you say, it's not just an external check. It's also recognizing that we have to be doing this work ourselves. And I kind of liken this, and you know, this sometimes sounds very, a little far uh, reaching, but you know, I really liken this to a lot of allies during this movement for racial justice who are pointing to institutions and saying, you know, you institution, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z without actually doing any self-examination and doing any work to see how we ourselves are upholding white supremacy, anti-blackness. It's not different. So I take a lot of learning from social justice movements, um, many of which I've been a part of. I'm on a a couple boards, even, you know, now, uh, but it's, it's something community organizing, like these are kind of movements that understand that change takes a lot of time. They know how to be effective. They understand it's one step forward, two steps back a lot of the time. And they, they know that you have to kind of be waging a many, many front, you know, effort. Uh, you have to, yeah, right. That's cohesive and it's about coalition building. So we have a lot to learn. And, and on that front, I hadn't thought about this connection with uh, justice movements, but I mean, you'll hear um, many of the like, you know, co-founders of Black Lives Matter talk about strategy, exactly. right? Because it's a strategic movement. And they'll talk about not underestimating your opposition, right? And understanding yes. what the counter response is going to yes. be. And I think um, one of my hopes, and we'll get into this now in a second, um, is that, it, that if, if we're trying to, not trying, if we are going to succeed um, in upending the current financial system and building something else, building something actually different, um, there will be tremendous amount of resistance to that and continue to be. And so the question is, what's the power we're going to have behind us? And I actually think that relates to mass adoption, that relates to people, that relates to actually creating things that people deeply, profoundly need. <laughs> Um, yep. and, and that means we need to be more aware of human beings than, than financial ecosystems have ever been. 
right, than financial infrastructure builders yep. have ever been, than financial regulators have ever been, right? The, the current financial ecosystem and the monetary policy and everything that is creating this has had a pretty distant experience of people. I mean, economists mm-hmm. aren't like, they aren't so excited to talk about the human part, you know, they're excited mm-hmm. to talk about the quantifiable parts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I actually, I think that in some ways, the, the more intelligent we are about mapping our way to mass adoption, um, the more successful for sure we're going to be in yeah. the ultimate goal. Yeah. And to do that, right, I think we have yeah. to look at what is what is actually the lowest hanging fruit there. Right. Well, funnily enough, it's people who have been excluded from traditional systems for whatever reason. They're the hardest to build for in many, many ways. But that is where you could add. They are in many ways the people that are going to be most willing to accommodate or try something new. And so you have these kind of two ends of the spectrum. Those who are just willing to um, have already disavowed traditional systems because they've kind of run through them and they've realized they don't, they aren't, they're, they're not a fit. Uh, and those who've never had access to those systems. And you know, separately, but related, when I first came into this role, one of the first things I said was, you know, the innovation is happening in, the, in, in frontier economies. Like it, it's just, that's where it is. That's where it is. And, you know, a lot of people thought I was crazy. They were just like, well, it's, who cares? Like, what are we going to learn from X, Y, and Z jurisdiction? You know, we, it's never going to matter if we don't, you know. Well, and there's not a lot of money. Adopted by this or that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And part of what we did with our central banks project was create a community of central banks. We were really forcing connections subtly and gently between a lot of the innovation and a lot of the incumbents who were interested in the technology. They were thinking about it in very narrow use cases because there wasn't a problem for them to solve. As far as they were concerned, things were fine. They were interested in it more for like, how can it make things faster, right? an efficiency kind of perspective. And at that time, particularly the latency was, there were all kinds of issues with doing that. So there were very few opportunities because of the latency for us to actually get that realization of the friction reduction that they were looking for. But in other economies, there was a lot of innovation happening because they had other problems. And then once you kind of learn and grow there, you can see how, oh, that model actually makes a lot of sense. We have that problem too. We've just almost built over it or buried it 10 layers down, but it's still a problem in our societies. We just ignore it. I actually had somebody early on tell me, you know, well, we're well aware that, you know, 20% of the population will never be able to access digital currency, but we don't really, we just don't really care about that. We're looking at the 80%. We're doing an 80, 20. I was like, hmm, interesting. Okay. Well, so your thing can be for the 80, but what about the 20, and are you comfortable that we're just kind of extending digital divide? And they, the response was, that's just, not, that's just not really my problem. You know, and so, again, I'm not naive. I, don't, I, I understand that there are tremendous uh, issues with kind of trying to create something that could really serve everyone. And so this is why I think, and you and I have talked about this, right? There are a multitude of offerings, especially in the digital currency, this is what is needed. CBDC has a role, crypto has a role, stablecoin has a role, various kinds of stablecoin have a role, various kinds of issuance CBDC have a role. And they're playing a different role. And so the idea that there's going to be this revolution where everything moves to one different model, in my mind, it just doesn't accommodate, as you say, the human, the human element it doesn't come into play there. Yeah, I I'm, I'm, couldn't agree more. I think on the point you made of, with central banks, I mean, one of the things we're wrestling with um, is maybe how to use the fact that, that, that their models really need to accommodate high risk. And so you actually can make the point, you know, that if you work with these populations you've never had access, you're actually building, you know, m- more risk averse models, m- better, more predictive exactly. models, right? The best model is everybody, <laughs> right? Because yeah. then you have all the data. So, I mean, I think that's, again, a communication challenge on our side of like, how do we actually make the point that from a technology first perspective also, I mean, no, we're, we, you and I will talk a lot about people, but I actually <laughs> yeah. realized we can make the argument from a technology first and even yes. efficiency friction list first yeah. place to, and to from, ado- from adoption, from product market from adoption, adoption, like you say. Yes. What I'm finding yes. so fascinating about right now, Shira, is that, you know, we've had this revolution, I think, in how we see public health. And now people understand something that we always should have known, which is we are only as healthy a society as our most vulnerable members, right? Like it, it, the virus doesn't care. It doesn't care how much money you make or where you live or whatever, right? Like it's, this is just, what we are failing to see is that our financial system is actually in many ways equally precarious. And it depends on the lens that you're taking. And we don't yet understand that financial security is to some extent predicated upon all the different actions in society having access, right? 
So, yeah. and it's not just access to capital, but access to, to stability. And so, right. um, the system's more interconnected. The catastrophic exactly. level of risk from not knowing That's right. those pieces is even worse. So, yeah. if you're not plugging those people in, then you're actually not aware of what's exactly. Yeah, and yeah. we're seeing it, and so I'm waiting for that to happen in our financial system. We're seeing it in public health. We're seeing it in our judicial system. We're seeing it in our, you know, our civic life. Uh, and we're we're getting there. I don't. I hope that we don't have to have some kind of precipitating crisis that gets us to like take off the blinders. But well, I mean, that's probably, that's probably what it is. <laughs> you well, know, another one, another financial crisis. I should say it's coming, well, right? So I'm sure it is. Many many financial crises. We're kind of in it. We're kind of in it. One. Yeah. But I, I think a part of, um, and we only have a few minutes left. But I think a part of why we you know wanted to to start this conversation and have this conversation with the audience. Um, continuing on Twitter or wherever else we dialogue around this mm -hmm. is, is that we actually do have a lot of power in building and architecting the new systems so that we, we, we prevent catastrophic risks. And we, so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm curious, people talk, I mean, mass adoption is such a buzzword in this space. I find that very few people actually talk about <laughs> what it is or why it matters. Um, I know for me, <laughs> I think um, one thing's very clear for me, and I'm curious if you agree or just the audience, mm -hmm. um, because this is financial infrastructure technology, I do not believe we will see a silver bullet killer app formation on the road to migration. I think this is mm -hmm. not a hockey stick type of analysis. And I think that's mm -hmm. what a lot of technologists have in mind when they think mass adoption. We've been, you know, we all see mm -hmm. these charts. Um, I think mass adoption is a system has to require a systemic approach. And so I'm curious, um, I know you guys, not just the Presidio principles, but you've also thought about some other pieces. Are there any systemic pieces that to you are essential on the road to map adoption or the, the map of what math, mass adoption will look like? Yeah. You know, I agree with you that everyone waiting for, you know, the Google, Uber, whatever, you know, it, I agree. I don't see it that way. I think if you look at maybe like a protocol level, I think is where people are kind of putting the play. That's interesting to me. I do think that you can kind of see where things are being built and where they're not, but we're, we're for that, we're still early. We're still pretty early in terms of what is going to be uh, the, the killer protocol, right? And people have their very strong views on that, so I'm not even going to go there anymore. But in terms of the app layer, I mean, I, I think you're right. It's kind of what I said earlier, like in digital currency, for example, I think that there are just there are a multitude of offerings that are going to kind of take off. And I think what's going to happen, what I hope is that there will be enough coalition building within the ecosystem that that transformation will be in any kind of one narrow swim lane. It'll be incremental ish, but then as taken as a, as a whole, it will be hugely revolutionary. That's how I see this kind of playing out. And I think we're seeing that with identity. We're seeing it with the supply chain work that's happening in different places and different applications there, uh, certainly in FinTech. So uh, I think that it is, there is more, there's, there's more and more room in this ecosystem. This is not a matter, I think, of a monopoly building. I don't want to see that. I think that is actually problematic. Uh, I think it is about creating that multitude of offerings that are together going to lead to a mass adoption transformation in terms of understanding how we're thinking about technology, where it fits into our stack. And like you say, uh, really fundamentally changing that human model. Yeah. I think in addition to what you shared, one other practical thing I'd offer to the audience to consider is that um, for, you know, so you mentioned kind of making sure that you recognize that if you offer a product, well, who's going to buy it, right? What are the, what are all yeah. the pieces in the ecosystem, right? We talk about this as like not a minimum viable product, but a minimum viable ecosystem for this technology to, to get mass adopted. And so as a player to be not so competitive only, but to also yeah. think in, in, around, you know, how will you succeed? What other players need to be lined up and are they lined up in the right way so that migration into mass adoption happens. But in addition, I think we do need to have a shift in how we talk about users, user experience, usability. Mm -hmm. I think we tend to, in the space, talk about it on a very surface level. Like we just talk about usability. Does the, is the app easy to use mm -hmm. and these kinds of things? Mm -hmm. um, I think for the human models that we're talking about to actually be developed and put into the data and business models and architected to make them successful, this is, needs to be a C-suite level strategic choice. Mm -hmm. um, investment in discovery, human research, both qualitative and quantitative, um, both, you know, ethnographic interviews and understanding different cultures, totally but also true. massive modeling of human behavior and, yeah. and all of these things. That has to be um, 
start, we need to start investing in that at a very totally high level financially yeah. and kind of, you know, prioritization wise. So it I think be a gating, a gating mechanism. You know, one of the things I had, I wrote an op-ed recently and one of the things I asked in that was like, where do these principles show up in your, in your, are they a gating, are they an actual legitimate gating function? Because if they're not, then they are by definition kind of a box checking exercise. If you're not actually making decisions that are predicated on your values and you're not using that to kind of decide what's in scope and out scope and every, everything else that you're doing, where you're investing your resources, then why have them at all? You know, what's, what's the point? And how do you create that accountability? I think it's something that is an ongoing, ongoing thing that we try to sort of do with the Presidio principles. But yeah, I, I think your point is exactly right. It's at all levels of an organization, all levels of an ecosystem. And I love that idea of a minimum viable ecosystem in order to engender mass adoption and to think about it as a systems change, not just my product will then have a monopoly on this in this area and be the only one doing this thing. Because that I, I, I agree with you. I don't see how that, that being how it's going to play out. Fantastic. Well, Sheila, we could continue on and we will. <laughs> <We're pretty good. laughs> we will uh, in public and in private, and we invite you to join us. There's a lot we didn't get to, and we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on what actually is the path to mass adoption? What is nobody talking about that they ought to be? And um, how do we approach the choices that we're facing with a lot of humility and integrity in order to make sure we really actually create something new in our future financial ecosystem? Anything you want to add, Sheila, as a thank you to our audience? Yeah, just thank you all for viewing. Uh, we'd love to connect uh, online, on Twitter, on social media. Uh, we'd love to have this conversation and open this up to a bigger audience. So we welcome your thoughts. Great. Thank you. Take Thanks. care.